Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandro. I'm a second year medical student here, as you all may know me. It's a great honor to introduce to you our special speaker today, Dr. Nariani. A little about her, you know, she's a cornea specialist, a practice surgeon, and an anterior segment on ocular oncologist with an immense experience in global ophthalmology. It is a true honor to hear her story today. She graduated from Tufts University in 2010 and completed her residency in 2015 from the University of Chicago. She has received numerous honors, including the top uh, 100 women in ophthalmology by the Ophthalmology Power List in 2021. So, you know, without further ado, um, let's please welcome Dr. Nermia. Well, thank you so much, Alejandro, and thank you everyone for being here. It's such an honor um, when Alejandro called me here and to be a part of such magnetism and passion for two worlds that I love so dearly, and that is ophthalmology and that is global surgery. I am just so honored to be here living a life of service in India, the journey west to east. A special, special thanks to all of you with special notice to Alejandro Perez, the president of the Ophthalmology Interest Group, who has honored me to be with you all today. If I can share with you one lesson that I have learned along the way amongst many, but the lesson that I wish to share with you today is, is really the fact that every step you take be it failure or be it success, is meant to take you to the next level in your life and to, to teach you the lessons you are meant to learn so that you can then build and grow in the path that you are meant to. Because what you are going to do, Alejandro, is going to be different from what Hani does. It's going to be different from what Anik does and each one of you. And so though you may all be in the same medical school, none of you, none of you, underline bold, none of you are going to do the same thing. So really there's no competition as much as we think there is because there's only one step one and there's only one step two and there's only one step three. But honestly, it is not ever going to come as a competition as you realize much, much later in life. And so walk the path that you are meant to walk, walk the strengths that you are meant to walk, don't walk anybody else's. And so this is where global surgery comes into play. When I was a medical student at Tufts University, I had done a, in undergrad, I did mathematics and chemistry. And I went to Oxford to do a year abroad because I was such a math geek. And so people were like, well, why would you do math? I mean, it's so crazy. Like your hair is just going to turn on end and you're going to look like such a nerd. And I was like, but that's what I love. But they're like, but you want to become a doctor, don't you? I said, perhaps, but right now my passion is math. So I kept following that, kept following that, finished so much math at Tufts that they were like, we don't know what to do with you. We pretty much... I have to send you somewhere else. And so I went to Oxford for a study abroad in mathematics and came back, went to medical school. I did a combined MD, MPH. I did the early BAMD program into Tufts and then followed by doing a uh, combined MD. And once I joined, I did the MD, MPH combined program. Along the way, it must have been during my master's in public health where, um, where we got the chance to do a global health fellowship somewhere in the world. And I did it in South India, working on malaria, malaria research. And I found it personally not my cup of tea, right? But my whole summer was on figuring out falciparum versus bivax. Without realizing it, I fall into the operation theater of the cardiothoracic surgeon. And I fell in love with cardiothoracic surgery. So much so that I used to scrub in with him as a medical student. And he started giving me parts of the cases to do. And then his physician assistant left the job or had to go or something like that. 
And because I happened to be there, I ended up suturing the saphenous vein onto the heart. Things that you do when you're a seventh year, perhaps cardiothoracic surgery fellow. I fell in love with cardiothoracic surgery. Fell in love. Fast forward to medical school coming back, I ended up meeting the cardiothoracic surgeons, taking the heart, bringing it into the helicopter with the cardiothoracic surgeons, flying with them. And one day I get a phone, uh, an email from Paul Farmer. If some of you may have heard of the book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, he is the writer of that. And he asked me, he's at uh, Harvard Medical School, and he said, would you like to come with us to Rwanda? And so even though I was at Tufts, somehow they found out that, you know, my passion was so much into cardiothoracic surgery. And they, you know, I, I was introduced to Team Heart, which is out of, I think, Mass General Hospital, where they do one week of, you know, cardiothoracic surgery cases in Rwanda every year. And it's in association with Partners in Health. And I was so excited. I was like, this is great. As I started to really pause, in medical school, we don't breathe. <laughs> we don't have time to think. We don't have time to really introspect. But I had the opportunity the fact of the matter is, is that I felt like I wanted to be in global for 52 weeks out of the year. And when I asked the team, how often do you go? They said one week in a year. And I, I just did not find that stimulating enough for me. Now you may say, how crazy is it? Like you guys know who Paul Farmer is. How can you even think twice? It's Paul Farmer. Yeah, but Paul Farmer has that passion, right? Someone else has that passion. But once I realized me, I realized I would want to do something that I can do my full life. I don't want to do something that's just one week out of the year. And so somehow I started to keep finding, okay, what can I do that is surgical, that is infectious disease, that is medicine, that brings in global health perfectly. And I can literally hop, skip, and jump from one country to the next. And that is when I found ophthalmology. So in my third year of medical school, I ended up doing a internship for two months at the World Health Organization in Geneva, identifying the prevalence of blindness in each and every country of the world. It was there that I realized that 90% of blindness is preventable or treatable. A simple surgery like cataract surgery or vitamin A for vitamin A deficiency in kids, right, can reverse these problems or treat it or cure it, right? So then it blew my mind to think that if 90% of blindness is preventable or treatable. What are we doing in this world? And cataract surgery is the most cost-effective cost surgery there is. At that time, it stunned me. Most cost-effective surgery of any surgeries in medicine is cataract surgery. And what is the leading cause of blindness, my friends, in the world? Cataract. It's great to see the global map. But what are we doing about it? How is it seeping in to grassroots level? And so I went back to medical school thereafter. Who was my inspiration to do all that I do? It is my spiritual mentor, my spiritual master, Dada J.P. Vaswani, whose photo you see here today. Early on in my life, he taught me a big lesson. That lesson was, that the end point of education, my friends, is service and sacrifice. Now, if I wanted to go after rewards, if I wanted to go after awards, perhaps I would have stayed in the United States. Perhaps I would have made an income that is probably six, seven digits. But my feeling was that 
I only have X number of days in my life. And those days are mine to choose. And I was seeking purpose. And so this message, my friends, really hit me. And it hits me till today. There will be difficulties in life where you will have to choose. Am I going to go this way or am I going to go that way? And it's not easy. But if you follow your heart and you don't follow the world, right, you will be following the path that's meant for you. And it may not always be the easiest. So fast forward, I moved after my fellowship. I did University of Chicago for residency in ophthalmology after being a Fulbright scholar in India at my spiritual master's institute um, in Pune, India, site for the sightless, the initiative, fell in love with ophthalmology, moved back, went to uh, residency at University of Chicago um, after doing internship in New Jersey, went to Duke for cornea transplant fellowship and eye banking fellowship. And it was after that, that I was getting a number of offers. But in 2017, July, when I finished, I was really at a crossroads in my life where I said, do I live the dream that I said I wanted to do, which was 52 weeks out of the year, if you guys remember, 52 weeks, not one week out of the year in cardiothoracic, 52 weeks out of the year, then that's going to be a leap of faith. And I'm going to have to do the move, whichever country it be. And it happened to be that I moved to India. And this is how this article was written uh, in Cataract and Refractive Surgery today about the um, move. There are no other U.S. ophthalmologists that have made the move. I must say that some of my biggest mentors growing up were saints. You know, on the right, you see Dada J.P. Vaswani and Didi Krishna Kumari. On the left, Mother Teresa. These ideals came before me as how is it that they can do so much for so many people, right? And, and so it kept on being inspiration throughout my life. Those um, people who don't ever look for fame and name, but how do they live their life to the fullest and for others? I love this quote, Devi Krishna Kumari, I, I will sleep when I am in heaven, right? And it's like, what are we doing here? We have only a few days left, right? I'm not saying burnout, but I'm saying, when you do what you love and you serve with all your heart, then it doesn't become work anymore. It just becomes a passion. And so after fellowship at Duke, I moved to India. So when I was at Duke, my mother passed away. And she passed away of metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. And she was a hardcore hey, we want to donate every, like all my organs. I want to donate everything from my hair to all my organs, to my eyes, everything. She put it in her will. When I was a cornea transplant fellow and my mother passed away during my cornea transplant fellowship, I was the one, just imagine like the role gets flipped. I was the one to pick up, the, to receive the phone call that your relative has passed away would you like to proceed with the donation of her eyes, right? She had already chosen it. I said, absolutely. But the roles reversed. I was a patient's relative and not the corneal transplant surgeon receiving the tissue, right? And so it was so fascinating to be on that side. And it was then I really believe that the more we can be able to provide you know, does not relate to just eyes. In my life today, I am working with heart, with kidney, with pancreas, with liver. So the world just, you know, there was a reason why cardiothoracic surgery and heart transplants came to me in at some point in my life, but it culminated in this realm that for me, I am hardcore into, into this and um, have been working in, in Ghana and other countries on this. And so, yeah, it was my mother who, who taught me that lesson. When I moved to India, though, in 2017, 18, guys, it was not easy. They did not understand why a U.S. ophthalmologist or U.S. doctor would move to India. Like, why would you take a seven-digit salary and make it into, like, nothing, right? And so, why? And, and they, so they were all suspicious, 
you know, and they, I don't know, bribery, corruption, all that. And I knew that if I was going to do it, I have to do it in the purest way possible. You either see that I'm American Board of Ophthalmology certified and you accept me for who I am, but I will definitely not bribe anyone. I didn't for over a year get my license. And I went from pillar to post writing to Prime Minister Modi, to the Prime Minister of India, the president, the chief ministers of everything. And this is a photograph of the chief minister of but you never know when the doors open. And if your heart is in the right place, this is what I will continue to tell you. It was the chief minister of railways who ended up seeing me, meeting me and saying to his team, help her. I finally got the license. They had to change the laws in India to allow me to practice. But it was then that I finally got it. And I started working at a government municipal hospital as assistant professor in Mumbai. It was just a joy to be there and to serve so many people. Last year, Cure Blindness, it's a nonprofit based out of the US, found me and asked me to join them as their global clinical consultant. And so if I'm not living in Pune, India, I am living on a plane. I'm in Ghana, I'm in Ethiopia, I'm in Nepal, and really work with the residents in ophthalmology, the fellows in super specialties, of not only just cornea, but retina, glaucoma, oculoplastics, pediatric ophthalmology, uveitis inflammation, to build the country from education, because I believe education is what's going to really move us ahead. The recurring theme that everything that happens to you is going to mold you. So organ donation came to me as a pretty strong message. And when I went to Ghana, I realized that 26,000 people live blind because of corneal disease. So when I joined them and I saw this problem, I said, we are bringing in last year, 31 corneal transplant tissues from people who have passed away and donated their eyes, say in from the US or Nepal or wherever. But when there's 26,000 people who are living blind, can you imagine what this wait list looks like? So the solution was a public health one. It wasn't a surgical one. We needed to get the country to accept tissue and organ transplantation. I organized this summit just this month. I just came back from Ghana where we met the paramount chief, met the presidential advisor on health. We met uh, the members of parliament. We met spiritual and faith leaders. We met nonprofits, not only cure blindness, but we brought in all the nonprofits of the country in eye care. And we sat together and we had a wham bam that hit the press like you wouldn't believe, basically in saying that, yes, it is time for Ghana to stand on its own two feet rather than just relying on tissue that comes from abroad. And that we need to not only do it in eyes, but we need to do it in heart, liver, and so forth. And so, it really brought all my worlds together from global surgery to cardiothoracic surgery, heart transplants to eye transplants all together and my public health background all in one. And so this is, this is me with one of the, Dr. Gladys, one of the four corneal transplant surgeons in the entire country of about 41 million people. There's only four corneal transplant surgeons there. I go to Ghana, I go to Nepal, I go to Ethiopia. This was me in Ethiopia in December teaching with Sight Life. It doesn't stop in medicine. So I actually did business school last year. You're always a lifelong learner. And so I went to Northwestern Business School. I was accepted to the physician CEO program. And I think what really caught their eyes was the fact that I was living abroad and my heart was in nonprofit work, which was a little bit unique to, to my classmates. Uh, my theme there was as a refractive surgeon, have, has anyone here had LASIK done? I see a few glasses. Yes, Shannon. Shannon has had LASIK done. Super. So we consider Shannon 
right? LASIK to be something that will get you independent of glasses. So you know what people till date do not realize is that there are many people in this world that cannot even tolerate glasses. A nonprofit comes in and they give you glasses. The next week it's off your face because it, it doesn't stay on. It's broken. It's not fitting, what have you. So it's a crutch, right? It's not a cure to refractive error. So one of the thoughts I had was in many fellowships, they teach us about refractive surgery. We know how to do LASIK, PRK, SMILE, all those great procedures, but it's known as the posh area of ophthalmology. So I had to break down the norms of everything I was taught in my training, minus knowing the surgical tools, pre-op and post-op, that was great. But this whole concept that it's a luxury sector within the realm of eye care, I had to break down the construct and say, wait a second, if there are so many people who are blind and it's also curable with laser vision correction, like LASIK. So I asked my colleagues and my mentors, I said, well, why is it that we've been trained that this is a luxury? Why can't we use LASIK to be able to provide it free of cost for a farmer in need. And they found this to be such a novel concept. The American Society for Cataract and Refractive Surgery, they provided me a grant to hold the first ever Global Refractive Surgery Summit. And that was held last year. We're going to hold one this year. And I'd be happy and honored to have each one of you part of that. We surgeons, lead ophthalmologists from all over the world in nonprofit saying to and for-profit, basically coming up with solutions and how we can make LASIK a tool for refractive error. Can you imagine the world just comes full speed? Our keynote addresses were twofold at the Global Refractive Surgery Summit. One was Jeff Tabin, who's the founder, co-founder of Cure Blindness and a Stanford professor in global ophthalmology and ophthalmology. But in addition to that, we had invited Paul Farmer. So though I had not talked to him since he sent me that email back when I was a medical student asking me to be to come to Rwanda with him, I am not here for rewards and awards. But when you follow your passion, my friends, it may not be an easy path. It may not be a traditional path, but it's your path. And along the way, people will realize the heart and soul of why you do what you do. And things will come to you like magnets, whether you want it or not. And so I received the, the recognition of top 100 women in ophthalmology. Um, I also was received, you know, the recipient of the top 40 ophthalmologists in the world under the age of 40. And I have to tell you that these are wonderful and um, congratulatory, but I never believe that any of it belongs to me because it was my spiritual master who brought me into this field of ophthalmology. I do it for him. Every talk that I do, I do it for him as an offering to him. And I realize that if it wasn't for the grace of the divine taking care of every step of the way, I wouldn't be where I am today. There are podcasts out there um, on the story and the journey and surgical and articles and all of that, but I still look at the global map and I realize I just do but grains of sand in the work that needs to be done right? 90% of blindness is preventable or treatable. 90% of it lies in developing countries. What have we achieved? We still have millions of people who are blind. I'm not here today to tell you to go into ophthalmology. I'm here to tell you that wherever your heart takes you, go with that. Take your heart and run with that, despite what the world has to tell you of where you need to go. I'll close with a quote from my master. Do as much good as you can to as many as you can on as many occasions as you can and as long as you can. I cannot believe 
that I could have ever been in India side working to leave Ghana, Ethiopia, India, Nepal in corneal transplantation and beyond in curing blindness. I would have never imagined <laughs> Like it's, it's, it's beyond like, I, I like till today, I just, I, I feel like I'm living my dream to do everything that I'm doing, to do business school, to do my master's in public health and to be able to do tissue and organ transplantation, to do surgeries and, and to be a part of so many people's lives.